The Republican convention in Cleveland will get the latest on what the Michigan delegation is thinking from Nolan Finley, who is there. Plus, our My Week Roundtable takes a look at the GOP message and where that leaves the Democrats for their convention next week. Stay put. My Week starts right now. Did you know Gordon Food Service was started by a 23-year-old entrepreneur as a butter and egg delivery business more than a century ago? In 1948, school teacher Gerard Wendell Hayworth borrowed $10,000 from his parents to start a woodworking operation in his family's garage. It's now Hayworth Incorporated. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. I'm Christy McDonald. We are so glad that you are with us. Republican or Democrat, let's face it, you were tuning into the coverage of the Republican convention in Cleveland this week. Would it be a brokered convention? Would there be chaos? Is this really the demise of the Republican Party? What would Donald Trump say next? There has been no shortage of headlines from Cleveland as well, from speech plagiarism to lack of diversity among the speakers. We're going to talk about it all, plus what Democrats can expect next week with our My Week roundtable. You will meet them in just a few minutes, but we are going to start with with our MyWeek contributor, Nolan Finley, the editorial page editor of the Detroit News, who is in Cleveland for the convention. He's been in the middle of it all, and he joins me now. Stephen Henderson has the week off this week. He's not down there with you, is he, Nolan? Yeah, I snuck him in. <laughs> all right, why don't you go ahead and just give us a, a sense of what it's been like there covering it. What, what would you say the tone of this convention has been? But it's unlike any convention I've been to. Uh, this is my ninth. Next week will be my 10th in Philadelphia. And usually you come in here and they're really prepackaged affairs. So there's very little drama at a convention. And I think Howard and some of the others on your panel there would, uh, would agree that the goal at a convention is no drama. And there has been something grabbing the headlines every night. Uh, you had the rules fight on day one, very loud, very boisterous, very demonstrative of the divided Republican Party. Uh, last night, you had Ted Cruz took the podium, gave a very powerful speech, very good speech. Uh, people were cheering throughout, and then it came down to the end. It became evident he was not going to vote or endorse uh, Donald Cruz. He said to the, to the delegates, vote your conscience. And at that point, the place just erupted with people shouting, um, endorse Trump, keep your pledge. I was sitting up in one of the RNC suites with what has to be considered the most establishment Republicans, and even they were shouting at Cruz. So, I mean, this thing has been uh, unusual to you say. You know, so, lady. but if the goal of really of a convention is to bring everybody together, do you think the mm -hmm. Republicans, I, I mean, do they have one more night to get their act together and be on the same page or what? I guess. I mean, it, a lot of it depends on, on the speech uh, Trump delivers, but I don't think they leave here united at all. In fact, I'm writing a column for tomorrow that says the strong undercurrent um, of this uh, convention is a uh, missed opportunity. A lot of Republicans here think this was their best chance to retake the White House. They're running against a very flawed candidate, a candidate with very high negatives coming off um, of this, the, the FBI investigation in which more than half Americans think she should have been indicted. And, and they're, they're posting the only candidate in the field with higher negatives than Hillary Clinton. So it, there is a sense of squandered opportunity here. What does Donald Trump have to say in his speech on Thursday night, do you think? I don't think it's as much what he says as how he presents himself. He's got to be presidential, and that's what we write today in our editorial. And a lot of people are afraid of this guy, and a lot of people you know, think, wow, his temperament is really questionable. And the tactics he used in the primary, the bully tactics and the name calling, I don't think that reassures voters um, that this is a guy who could sit in the Oval Office and they can be comfortable with that. So I think he has to be a peer presidential. And, you know, I, I'm, I think that's a big challenge for him. You know, but if he can't even get all the Republicans on board with him, I mean, what, what chance do Republicans then have to get independents, get some Democrats to come over um, and, and win a general election? 
you know, who knows? I mean, this is such a, there's so many variables in this election that are unpredictable. Again, the unpopularity of, of Hillary Clinton. So does this come down to an election of who you like least? Uh, there are going to be a lot of voters. I keep hearing, you know, Republican operatives tell me this week that the polling is missing a lot of support from folks who normally don't vote but will come out to vote for Donald Trump. There's some predictions that it'll be a 2010 type election where the pundits and the pollsters miss what turned out to be a, a wave election, a movement election. But I don't know. I can't predict. I think you do have probably a quarter of the Republicans here who won't vote for Donald Trump. And you have a lot of Republicans who aren't here. John Kasich, governor of Ohio, this is his state. He's hosting the convention. He is not speaking at the convention. Uh, Rick Snyder had a video presentation, and that's that's it. None of the Bushes are here. Mitt Romney's not here. John McCain's not here. There's a large swath of the party that's not in Cleveland. Uh, Nolan, talk to me a little bit about the Michigan delegation, how the convention is going over for them, um, where maybe some of the money might be shaking out in Michigan for the Republicans. Well, I mean, I, a lot of um, re big Republican donors, as I, you know, I wrote yesterday, um, a lot of the big Republican donors sitting on their wallets this year. They are not writing a, a check to the Trump campaign. In fact, the Trump campaign is not even doing fundraising, which is very unusual. The campaign, the RNC, is, is fundraising both for Trump and for itself. And a lot of donors are either, either not writing checks or writing checks to the RNC for use partially by the presidential campaign, but also by the congressional candidates, state races, et cetera. And a lot of people, you know, particularly in the Michigan delegation who normally write big checks, are writing checks to the Michigan party um, in an effort to save the state house. I mean, there's real fear about what happens down the ticket if this turns out to be a rout of Trump in November. You know, there are also little storylines that also come out uh, during the convention. And I think it, it, all the coverage that I've seen looking at the Michigan delegation, I, I can't see a picture without. I see Bill Schuette serving coffee to Republicans yeah. at every single breakfast <laughs> there is. Talk to us a little bit about some of the other political storylines that are weaving around uh, the Michigan delegation down in Cleveland this week. Well, Snyder comes in in an hour, or comes in uh, Thursday morning, he came in Thursday morning for a brunch with the Michigan delegation. He didn't go to the convention hall, um, but, you know, he is really stepping up his political engagement, as I, as I wrote today, this season. I mean, he does not want this House election to be a referendum on him. And he knows that if he loses the House, his chances of getting the things he wants done, particularly in Flint, um, become much, much slimmer. And so you have that dynamic. Bill Schuette is all over the place. I mean, he's the, you know, the de facto leader of the Republican Party in Michigan, and he's clearly building um, building his, his uh, 2018 uh, gubernatorial campaign. I haven't seen a whole lot of uh, Brian Kelly, but you see Bill Schuette everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we have uh, just this one last night, and you'll be heading out on Friday and then heading to Philadelphia, right? Yeah, Kid Rock tonight, baby. Uh, well, you know, you can't miss that. You cannot miss that. All right, Nolan, <laughs> we look forward to seeing you, and uh, we'll hear from you next week when you are in Philly with the Democrats. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Okay, see you then. You got it. Thank you. All right, well, let's get to our roundtable with some familiar and some new faces here on My Week. Karen Dumas, the former communications head for Detroit Mayor Dave Bing, now the host of Afternoon Drive on WFDF 910 AM Radio. Karen, welcome to My Week. It's Thank good you, to Christy. see you. Nice to see you, too. And also Howard Edelson, a political strategist for the Democrats. Howard, you've been on before, so welcome back. It's good to see you. Well, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. All right, and now on the left side of the table, did you see how I kind of changed the <laughs> switch that up a little bit? On this side, Dennis Darnoy, Republican political strategist out of Oakland County. Dennis, it's good to see you again. Welcome yep. back. Thank you for having me. And also, first time we're here, Caitlin Buss. She is the senior editorial writer and columnist with the Detroit News. Welcome to my week, Caitlin. It's good to see you. All right, so now um, we get to talk about what has happened uh, all week long here with the Republicans. And this has really been something to see, and no one really touched on it. Um, I'm going to start with you, Dennis. Why don't you go ahead and give me um, what your thoughts were in terms of what you've seen this week coming out from the Republicans, tone and message. Um, well, tone is anger um, and directed very uh, specifically to Hillary Clinton. We talk about what unifies the party. Defeat of Hillary Clinton does. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, you have people who aren't there right now, but in November they will be there. They'll be there to, to you know, defeat her. That's the driving, motivating factor. 
we all want to judge Trump by the traditional political standards, and if we do that, yeah, the convention has been very poor, hasn't been organized, very uneven. But at the end of the day, all that people are going to remember is what's said tonight in his speech. And they will unify after tonight to defeat Hillary Clinton. Do you think you, you need to hear some more specifics from Donald Trump about how he's going to achieve certain things to make America great again? Or does he just need to continue giving that message? No, I mean, no one hit it on the head. This is going to be an election about who do you dislike less. Um, so he doesn't need to be specific. He doesn't have to talk about what programs he's going to implement. He just has to point out how horrible it's going to be under four more years of, you know, an extension of, of the Obama presidency as embraced by Hillary Clinton. That will be enough to bring uh, Republican voters out in November. All right, Karen, overall tone, overall thoughts when you've been watching this happen in Cleveland this week. I I'm really not sure if I'm watching a frat party or a commercial for a prescription drug on television. You know, how they feed into your fears. I've heard nothing of substance uh, relative to policy, but it has been consistent with Donald Trump's message from start to finish. And and that's a disappointment because it speaks to, um, I guess, their underestimation of the American voters, that we don't have to tell you anything of substance. All we can do is feed your fears uh, and, and give you foolishness to, you know, create headlines and, and uh, sound bites from here on out. Very disappointing. Very disappointing. No substance at all. All right, Caitlin, what do you think in terms of no substance or the platform of fear? I think the first few nights, uh, Monday and Tuesday, certainly had that fear element. I mean, they were kind of crazy to watch, uh, especially on TV. But last night, they did get a little bit more into the substance, and I think the presence of Pence, um, you know, he was a little weightier. He has more of those conservative cred credentials that a lot of uh, people in the party are looking for, and, you know, he's, he's there on substance. So I think they're starting to get in that direction. We'll see how much substance Donald Trump brings tonight. I think they know that he's more the brand. Um, and he doesn't necessarily need to have the substance, but like you said, you know, voters want to see that from him, and at some point we're going to have to see it, and, and I hope there's some of that tonight. Howard? Well, for sure this is uh, the most unique election I think any of us have seen in our lifetime. Uh, if you think about the Republican primary, it started out with 17 candidates, all of them in one way or another peddling fear, doom, and gloom. Whether it's immigrants coming over from Mexico, we got to build a wall, uh, go buy your guns because they're going to take them away from you. That's how they motivate uh, the American public. And so what we're seeing is just an extension of fear, doom, and gloom. And we've heard that throughout the entire uh, convention now. And, you know, I think they've made the strategy, to Dennis's point, that, you know, there's two ways of getting people to vote. Uh, it's either vote for something or vote against something. And they know they have a toxic candidate, a unique candidate, uh, and they're not going to get people to vote for him. It's a much easier to take down Hillary Clinton, prosecute a no vote, get people to vote no. So I think that's what we've seen. I think we'll continue to see that. And it's going to be, at the end, uh, a historic, the lesser of two evils uh, election. You know, it's interesting because when I watch this, and you know, I, I look and see you know, Republicans have an opportunity here. They have primetime coverage all week long to throw their message out, and not just to get Republicans on board, which is what they seem to have been trying to do all along, like let's unite, but to try to get everybody else, try to get pull from other different parties or pull from people who may not have voted before. You know, coming out of 2012, Dennis, they were talking a lot about how, gosh, we need to attract women. And we need to attract minorities. We need to kind of change things in looking back at this election that we lost. What has changed now in the last four years? They've been able to change the wheel on that because looking at the crowd in Cleveland, which seems very male and white to me, I'm not quite sure that Republicans have been able to incorporate a lot of those changes that they say coming out of 2012. Ah, uh, we got to learn from our mistakes. Sure. I mean, I think Donald Trump saw an opportunity. Um, as, as Howard mentioned, it was an incredibly packed primary field. Um, so maybe. All the other candidates may have implemented, you know, we did the autopsy after 2012 right. and said, how do we expand our party? Um, Trump said, no, I don't need to do that. And, and, and again, I think if you try to measure Trump's candidacy by traditional political metrics, he's always going to fail. But I think part of his attraction right now is he tells it like it is. He, as his kids said, you know, he's very forthcoming. He's very upfront with what his message is, and it's resonating. 
So let me ask you, Karen, then. So when people when people see this and they watch, do you think then people who aren't Republicans or staunch Democrats, that they're just going to stay home? Is well, that what we're going to see an election of? That, that's the fear, because you've got a lot of people that are supporting Hillary Clinton, and they're not really clear as to why they're supporting Hillary Clinton. So I'm not so sure that anybody on either side is comfortable with, with the options. But you can't talk about building a party or building or rebuilding America and then continue to have divisive conversation. You saw Congressman King yesterday say, you know, you know, White people have done more to contribute uh, to this country more than any other subgroup ever before. I mean, look at the conversation of even the people who are supporting Trump. You're talking about taking America back at a time now more than ever when we should be talking about moving forward. Caitlin, did you see that from uh, uh, Congressman King? It was a, a little inflammatory I, rhetoric. There. I actually did not see that. I must have been Whoa. putting my baby to sleep at that point <laughs> oh or something. But um, I, I did, you know, on the speaker diversity issue, I, I thought last night was a bit more diverse, and they did start hitting on some of the, you know, LGB. Uh, T issues. Um, they, they certainly mentioned people more. I mean, even Newt Gingrich mentioned them, and he tried to be inclusive of Muslims. So th maybe they're hearing some of this feedback and trying to change course now at the convention. Um, I thought the crowd was, you know, from panning the audience, uh, diverse. I mean, it is a Republican convention, but but to your point, Trump has drawn in people from other ends, you know, of, of the political spectrum, Democrats and, and some independents, that he has grown the party in kind of untraditional ways that we're not, you know, used to seeing. <laughs> He's well, Howard, yeah. So I'd say uh, some of the uh, conversation you're hearing, some of the sound bites, that's just lip service. Let's just look at the party. Look at the convention delegates. When the, that camera pans through the convention, it is overwhelmingly, I would probably not be far-fetched saying 99.9% .9 white, uh, de white delegates. And, you know, this is a party that has been hijacked by the Tea Party uh, several uh, election cycles ago. Th they can't reform. They have moved so far to the right. They're at civil war with themselves. Let's remember, there was a, a gentleman by the name of Speaker John Boehner, a, the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, that got deposed by his own party. When has that ever happened in the history of our country by their own party? They are a party uh, that is not unified. Unified. They are at civil war with themselves. They get smaller and smaller as they get more conservative and conservative. So when you hear stuff about the LGBT community, this or minority, that, it's lip service. You think it's lip service? Do you think where there's a civil war on? Well, no, I don't think it's lip service. And to, to a certain extent about civil war, I do think there are two factions right now. You do have the more traditional, we would have liked to have a better rollout for our candidate, um, you know, convention that follows traditional norms. And that was... And maybe what, not Scott Baio as a speaker. And, I mean, you know, you Chachi know. not showing up and... and <laughs> would, would, I mean... But, um, you know, and that was more, I think, the Jeb Bush wing. Um, and that was proven not to be successful this cycle. So yeah, there, there is a division in terms of how do we move forward. Some say Trump's the nominee, follow his path. There are others who, like Ted Cruz last night, I mean, clearly that was a pitch to run in 2020. Um, he, he wants to go in a different direction. So yeah, there, there is disagreement. The Civil War, I mean, that's, that's a nice little phrase from Howard, but I wouldn't put it to that <laughs> level just yet. I mean, we could talk about the, the Hillary versus Bernie supporters and call there a bit of Civil War. Um, oh, well. But Fair we'll, enough. we'll, I mean, we'll that, see next we'll, week yeah, we if will that find civil out. war that's continues. Be, yeah, I mean, so is there disagreement? Absolutely. Is there a, a unified uh, path in, in how to move forward? No, there's not, but there's nothing really wrong with that. You know, I think it's really interesting, though, I mean, when you when you look also at some of the things that have happened over the convention this week, it, it feels like um, everything the Republicans wanted people to focus on they really happened. I mean, you had Melania Trump and everything that happened around her speech and the plagiarism charges and, you know, taking days to come out and say yes, no, or maybe so. Um, and then you had you had Ted Cruz come out last night, and no one then really paid attention to Pence because everyone was talking about what Cruz did just before. Caitlin, um, go ahead and give us a, what your thoughts are on on taking a look at some of the distractions that the Republicans haven't been able to get you know focused totally on what they want people to focus on. Yeah, and I think I think the media has fed into that perhaps a little bit, uh, you know, focusing on the Melania speech and then last night focusing on on Senator Cruz, uh, Trump. Trump apparently knew about Cruz's speech beforehand and kind of did a funny move of coming in at the very end to upstage him and then, you know, no one was paying attention to Cruz at the end there. So I, I think I think Trump uh, knew that that was going to happen. I think tonight will be really telling if they can bring that, that 
you know, lack of distraction together. But I did think last night was an improvement over the first two nights in getting their message out. And I thought Pence did a great job. I thought to conservatives, he did a really uh, a strong performance. Hey, Karen, is the media overblowing stuff? Has the media, have we been fair? This, uh, this week, do you think? I think I think so, yes, because I think these are things that people want to know, and I don't think, I think the attempt by the Republican Party to constantly trivialize its missteps is 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 uh, disingenuous, um, and I think it's unfair. So, no, I don't think the media has been unfair. People need to know what's really going on, uh, and I think uh, Cruz last night was attempt, that, that was payback for all the personal attacks that Trump uh, delivered mm -hmm. to him, you know, early on in the campaign. So, I mean, it's all personal, uh, and nothing is being on lip service. You don't start to build a brand or strengthen or build a party in your final days of the convention. And I, yeah. and, and I think oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, so I, mean, I want to pick up with Howard. No, to her point, I, I think it's right. And it was payback. And, and it's, it's proof that Trump is not running a traditional political organization. There has been nothing traditional about this <laughs> entire thing. Absolutely <laughs> not, because the way it's done, and, and, and Karen and Howard can attest to this, you vet your speakers, you vet what they're going to say, you, you, you don't allow someone, and even if he knew two hours in advance, I'm sorry, in the past, you're going to know days in advance. So, yeah, he's just, it, this is part of the Trump train. Just get on and enjoy the ride. And, and I well, think, or, or really belt yourself I, in. Go ahead, sure. Howard. I, you know, I'm enjoying it as a Democrat. I'm not sure <laughs> as Republicans you should be enjoying it. But you're right, he's unique. Uh, Donald Trump is running as a celebrity on mm -hmm. a... Mm -hmm. Uh, a reality TV show. He's been doing this throughout the entire campaign. He knows how to move people. He knows a brand. But back to your question about media, I think your coverage uh, overall, the coverage has been good. I think in a 24-hour news cycle, now that you have social media, the, there's a tendency to you know go to the the brightest thing and you know maybe over report but overall I think you guys have um, the media has really covered. I call it the squirrel factor squirrel yeah, just jumps exactly. to one side go ahead Caitlin like, you want to say something oh, I, I just think you know um, and, and you're not necessarily part of this but the media has been trying to keep putting it in this box put the Trump campaign and the convention into this box and every time it's outside the box you know that's noticeable and they kind of talk about it a lot but I think that's what voters have been pushing for obviously at least in the Republican Party so they're not necessarily disappointed in a chaotic show I, if I could just one more thing on uh, these miscues um, the you know these are self and Inflicted, uh, step on your message mistakes. I, I kind of liken it to golf. I don't know how many of you play golf, but you know when your putt is like six inches from the hole, and someone says, "Ah, oh, that's a give me," they're missing the give me's, and they are making these self-inflicted wounds. Whether it's not vetting the Cruz speech, the Melania speech, whether it's what they did with the the, the party rule on the opening day that caused a whole entire mm -hmm. state delegation to walk out. These are self-inflicted wounds that step on the candidate's message. And, and so I... And yeah, well, so let's talk about what, coming out of this, we were talking a little bit even before the cameras started rolling about what kind of bounce Donald Trump can expect from, from this convention. And, and again, predicting anything and predicting numbers has been so weird, Dennis. Sure. I mean, traditionally what you see is Republican candidates from 88 through 2012, they get about a 4.5% bounce in the polls. He's you know polling at about 41% right now. That would put him up to about 45%. Mitt Romney uh, in 2012 didn't enjoy such uh, success. So I think for us, we're going to measure that metric. What are his poll numbers coming out of the convention? What is, is his bounce. Is it a traditional bounce or is it something like 2012, uh, the two-point bounce that, that Romney got? And that will tell us a lot uh, as we head into the Democratic Convention. All right, and we are going to be heading into the Democratic Convention in Philly next week. And so, Karen, let me start with you. I mean, as we look forward now, what do the Democrats have to do here to all of a sudden take the message and take all the spotlight and bring it to where they are now? Not duplicate what happened at the Republican Convention. I mean, be on point and understand your core messages. Make sure there's some consistency. Um, at least present unity if, uh, if there's none. I mean, you want to keep your dirty laundry hidden uh, and, and see. But, you know, I'd like I think Hillary is going to have to establish a degree of trust. People still find her untrustworthy, and I think people are looking for something from her uh, to confirm that she can be or should be uh, trustworthy and presidential. Yeah, but don't you think that's going to be difficult to, to recreate in Almost four days? Almost impossible. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I think that's the challenge. Okay. Caitlin, what do you think that you're gonna, we're going to be seeing from the Democrats next week? I think that she, you know, everyone's been counting up how many times the word Hillary Clinton has come up at the Republican convention. I think she's going to have to match that a little bit. I mean, their party 
remains, you know, very ununited as well. I mean, Bernie uh, still has some, you know, delegates out there. Um, so they're going to have to unite around an anti-Trump message, too. I think that's going to be the most effective thing for them. So while I know they, you know, want to keep a positive message and talk about, you know, what she can do for people, they are going to have to have some of that negativity to, to counter what's happened this week. I okay. Think. Go ahead, Dennis. What do you think? Uh, Karen's dead on. It's going to be the exact opposite of what we've seen out of the Republicans. It's going to be organized. You're going to have a wide swath of diversity um, talking on issues that uh, Republicans haven't even touched on. And honestly, again, I think that sets up the election perfectly because there are those who support Trump and who do not support Hillary because she is as scripted and in a box as you can possibly get. She is, you know, the political establishment writ large. And so to juxtapose the two is actually going to play well in the November election. All right, 15 seconds. Go ahead, Howard. Working together, uh, accomplishments, and then what the future is like. That's what the convention is going to show. And then in terms of her, she's going to work on likability. It's a lot easier to work on likability than trustworthiness. And I hope as it shows everyone that they've got to be invested in this process. You watch what the Republicans do this week, watch what the Democrats do next week, and remember that your vote counts more than anything. Karen Dumas, <laughs> Howard Edelson, Dennis Darnoy, Caitlin Buss, thank you so much for joining us. So I appreciate it. And that's going to do it for my week. Thanks for joining us. Nolan will be heading to the Democratic Convention in Philly next week. He'll join us from there. And our Myra contributor, Stephen Henderson, will be back at the desk for that. Make sure you find us Facebook, Twitter. Take care. Did you know Roush Enterprises was selected by Google to assemble a test fleet of 100 prototype self-driving cars in 2015. It also produced the new Domino's delivery cars. And speaking of Domino's, Domino sells well over 2 million pizzas per day around the world and half of their sales are digital. These are just some of the ways Michigan's pioneers started out as small companies with big ideas. We are business leaders for Michigan. We are committed to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Funding is also provided by Delta.